So what I want to go through today is the environmental law in South Africa. So the first thing that I need to highlight in terms of this is that we are going to cover the entire spectrum of the environmental law in South Africa in an hour and a half or less. That is ridiculously short amount of time to do this. So we are really just touching on on this. As you probably know, it takes two degrees to get a law degree at WITS or generally takes two degrees. If you want to do environmental law at WITS, it's a postgraduate diploma. So it's a full year on top of that. And it's generally a master's specialization to do environmental law in South Africa. So anything that I say here is very brief. And please just double check on anything I say because I'm not a lawyer, I'm an engineer. So some of the things that I say, you might need to just double check on if I get my specifics wrong on this. Okay, so just a disclaimer up front. So the first thing obviously is why do we need to worry about environmental law? So we asked last week, is actually, is, is the environment important to South Africa when we have such big issues around us anyway? Should we really be worried about the environment? And the answer to that, the short answer to that was yes, we definitely have to worry about it. The first reason is not only is it a good thing for humans, but it is also the law. We have to. Okay. So why do we do this for engineers? And why do you in particular need to worry about the law? It's because engineers in general, we need to, or we want to demonstrate that you are actually accountable for your actions. The big law item here that is possibly relevant is that it is typically understood that the polluter pays. So I was, so what I was saying is why do we need environmental law? So there are various reasons why we need this. The first one is to keep yourself protected. So we need this because there are laws in South Africa. There are going to be consequences to you personally as an engineer if you don't abide by certain laws. And these laws we're going to get to in a little bit. So you personally can be liable. Your company could also be liable. So in terms of what you do as a company, you could be liable in terms of your, your company could get into trouble as well. So there's risk both to yourself and the company to ensure that you comply by this legal framework. So we want zero legal contraventions. We want to make sure that the environment, that the, we comply with the environment and we'll get to what the legal, what the different laws are in terms of this now. But we also just want to be good citizens and we want to minimize or prevent environmental degradation. So those are the main reasons why we have environmental law. So as I said, for those of, for when I was on mute or not talking, the main act in South Africa is going to be the National Environmental Management Act, which is Act 107 of 1998. And in particular, Section 28 says, states that reasonable measures should be taken to prevent pollution or environmental degradation from occurring. So reasonable measures, what exactly are those reasonable measures? It also includes to educate employees about the environment. So when you are one day an engineer, you are going to be have hold a position of responsibility. And if you see something going wrong, both or from a health and safety point of view, an environmental point of view, or something else like that, you should, as an engineer, as a qualified engineer, as somebody with authority and respect, you need to be able to be educating your employees about what exactly the environmental risks are, either in your facility, around your facility, to reduce pollution, to avoid pollution, as well as environmental degradation. So this National Environmental Management Act um, is one of the big issues that we are going to that you will deal with on this. Sorry, let me just go to Teams again because it seems like I've dropped off on Teams. No, on Big Blue Button. Okay, so I think am I back onto Big Blue Button? Well, this is too many things for me to follow at the moment, unfortunately. Okay, so saying this for a third time, sorry, we now got big blue button back on again. The big act that we are going to worry about in South Africa is the Environmental Management Act, Act 107 of 1998. And what this act says is that we need to take responsible measures to prevent pollution or environmental degradation. So as an engineer, you are going to also be in a position of seniority in your company when you graduate one day and you start working. So the reasonable measures that are prescribed in that section also include that you are responsible and you should educate your employees or your fellow employees, those that are under you, on the environmental risks and what is actually happening in your company, around your company, in order to reduce the amount of pollution, the amount of environmental degradation and various other things that you might see as an educated person on what is bad for the environment. Okay, that is the law. 
The second one is the need for environmental management is that a lot of you are going to get one day to work for companies where they're going to talk to you about various different ISO standards. So the ISO standards in terms of the 14,000, so it's the 14,000 somethings, are all related to environmental management of some sort. It starts with 14,001, which requires companies to be compliant with environmental management systems. So that compliance means there is a legal compliance, zero environmental incidents, and a continual improvement in terms of your environmental situation as a company. So a lot of you will he have probably heard about ISO 9000, that's a quality system. Most companies aim for that. The other one that everyone aims for is this ISO 14001 environmental compliance. If you look up any of the ISO standards, so that's the international standards, organization standards, anything, as I say, with 14 that starts with 14 is going to be related to the environment. So there are a lot of these. I know there's 14001 is the one in front of us, 14040 is life cycle assessment. There's 14,044, 14,046 for water footprinting, carbon footprinting, eco efficiencies, and various other things. So we will get to that later in the course. But that's just to let you know that it is not only a legal requirement, well, it is a legal requirement that you follow, that you abide, that you aim at least to keep the environment clean. But most companies also have a second layer, which is the ISO standard, in order to do this. Okay. What happens if you don't? So what happens if I decide that I'm not going to worry about the air emissions, the water pollution, anything like that? So the obvious ones are that you could go to jail. So you could go to jail, you could have a fine, you could have loss of a license or similar. So if you are a professional engineer at your company one day and you have that PR Eng title behind your name and you do something at your company that results in some sort of environmental disaster, you could at the very best lose your license. So you could lose your PR Eng license. That could mean that you lose your job. So losing a job is going to have huge implications. Fines is a bit of money, but you could also actually go to jail. So if you are the responsible person at your company and something happens at your company that you could have avoided, you will go to jail in a personal capacity. Obviously, financial consequences can be huge for companies. If you start having oil spills or explosions and people start dying, either from explosions or from air pollution and things like that, Again, those financial consequences are going to be huge and your company, even as something as big as a multinational, could go under because of actions that you are responsible for. There is obviously also the very big one of public perception. So BP, let's just use that as the terrible example for now. BP used to stand for British Petroleum. They now stand for Beyond Petroleum. So they're trying to make themselves look like they are cleaner than they re than they they were before so they're taking the environment into account so something a change like that is to try and avoid the public perception of how good or bad petroleum companies are so losing confidence with your clients your consumers rather you can have huge this consequences the last one obviously is going to be the personal consequence, you're going to lose your job, which we've said already between at the start with legal consequences. Okay, so I've got some messages, some messages that come in on the private chat. I just want to read through them quickly in case I've skipped over something that somebody wants to ask. Okay, so the question in private chat, I'll get to now. You're skipping a slide or, or two ahead. Okay, so in terms of the law, what exactly is the history of it. The history, we don't need to worry too much about the history of it. So obviously we had a question in last week's TUT of what is the, what is the statement dilution is the solution? Where exactly does that come from and why do we have some things? So the way that people used to decide what your limits were for air pollution and water pollution used to be a concentration value. So the answer to your TUT, week, TUT last week was really about the way that pollution used to get measured. So in the past, a company, a Sassel, a BP, and anything with a factory used to be given a limit in terms of concentration. So your air stack was allowed to emit a certain concentration of sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, whatever those might have been. So if, for instance, your, your um, company was allowed to emit 200 parts per million of CO2, and your company was emitting quite a lot, the solution to that literally was dilution. So a company that had an air stack that was emitting 
large amounts of air pollution would simply add a fan to the side of it or they would add a, get another gas stream, a pure oxygen stream, so that when you saw the emissions coming out of your stack, it had been diluted and it was literally within the legal requirements as you were needed by your license. Okay, so that was as way back as the Industrial Revolution, the Stockholm Convention in 1972. So from 1972 onwards, there have been a lot more stricter requirements in terms of the legal side and the law as needed by this. So I'm seeing a whole lot of messages coming through now as well. Does that mean you can't hear me anymore? Okay, no, these are unrelated messages. Okay. So in terms of the environmental law, in terms of South Africa in particular, there are going to be, there, well not going to be, there are various different branches. So the branches of law in South Africa and the things that we need to take into account include legislation, so that's going to be the topmost law in the country. We also have precedent, so precedent is going to be any court decisions, so if you are found guilty of something today, in two years time, if somebody commits the same crime, they use that precedent or the court decision from previously to hand down the same fine or the same outcome to you. So that's what precedent is for the court decisions. We also have common law. So I'm not quite sure how common common law is or how, how often common law comes into play for environmental law. As a non-lawyer, the only area where I know common law is common law spouse. So if you live with your partner for long enough or for a certain length of time, you become a common law partner, so you are effectively married to that person under common law. There are also going to be customs, indigenous law. There are publications of legal authors, which will count as law. There are also religious-based systems or legal systems, as well as international law. So there are certain international laws that might be applicable to South Africa. There might be these that are more important for things like out in the middle of the ocean, but certain environment, sorry, certain international law will be applicable to us. The first question on this, though, is what exactly do we look at first? So there is a hierarchy in South African law. That hierarchy is going to start, in terms of the legislation, is going to start with the Constitution. So that's the Constitution of South Africa. We have national legislation, provincial legislation for each of the provinces, for Gauteng, Pumalanga, etc., as well as local bylaws. So typically the local bylaws are things that state what time you can party until, what, what the liquor licenses are in the area where you can have those sort of things. Provincial legislation, while it is still fairly common, some of it does date back to when we had the old South Africa where the provinces were slightly different. So you will see some legislation that talks about Natal or Transvaal which will then be applicable to whatever the geographical boundaries are now. So just watch out when you see provincial legislation. Some of it is fairly old, but it is still relevant. And we'll get back to these in a slide or two's time. Okay, so as I said, common law. So in terms of the hierarchy, we're going to have all of those other legislations coming in first. The common law. This is where a matter is not specifically governed by any of the legislation. So the legislation was on that previous slide. And this is based on the general understanding that South Africa still runs according to the 17th and 18th century Roman Dutch law. So that's where common law comes from. It is still binding and it can be interpreted from case law. So as we said from precedent, so if there is a case that happens and you are found guilty of something, five, 10 years later, if somebody does the same thing, you are still going to be bound by that. So that is part of the common law, the precedent that we spoke about earlier. I'm not going to, in this course, we're not going to worry about common law. So let me just go back to the list of the environmental law that we have. In this course, we are not going to worry about common law, customs, indigenous law, publications, religious or international law, sorry, or precedent. The only one we are going to worry about for this course is legislation. So just for you to know is that there is a hierarchy the only one that we are going to worry about in this course is the legislation, so that being the constitution, national, provincial, and local bylaws. And we're going to start at the top of that with the constitution. So in terms of the South African legal constitution, I'm sure you've all seen that little book that that person is holding on the left. Okay, so yeah. the question I was asking, and I was hoping that somebody would type while I was answering some of the private messages was, why have I put the right to realization of basic human rights as one of the issues for environmental law. 
Okay, in the same way we could say why have I put up the right to equality and special measures to overcome unfair discrimination and advantage? Why would we put these two up as part of environmental law? Okay, so I, again, I don't know if I'm online or if I'm not online, if nobody's trying to talk to me or not. So the reason for this is that the basic human rights, we have the right and to and the access to free, or not to, to clean water, we have basic human rights of food, water, equality, so all of those things are part of the environment. So if we want to have water, we need to have clean clean water. We obviously can't have the rest of the world polluting the water if our, one of our basic rights is to access to clean water, to clean drinking water. The right to quality or special measures, measures to unfair discrimination, that includes things like environment, the environment. So we shouldn't be discriminated against or unfair discriminated or disadvantaged because we have some massive industrial facility right next to our door. There should be equality in terms of where people place these sort of structures as well. So those are the start of the Constitution. Further down in the Constitution, we get to Section 24. And Section 24 is all about the environment. So given that we're having such terrible time with this presentation here, I suggest that you go through the Constitution in your own time and go and click on that link, as I say, at the bottom there that should send you to the Constitution. Section 24, as I say, is in terms of the environment. So everyone has the right to an environment that is not harmful to their health or well-being. So we shouldn't be have be settled for air pollution and dirty water. Everyone also has the right, Part B, to have the environment protected for the benefit of both the present but also the future generations. So yes, we need to have wood and we have we need to cut down some trees every now and again, but that doesn't mean that we should be cutting down all the trees because then that nice forest in Brazil or wherever, or KwaZulu Natal, the Eastern Cape, the garden root areas will not benefit, the future generations will not benefit through that. So we must prevent pollution, ecological degradation, and pr promote conservation. So the conservation side, we can't, we might not necessarily be directly promoting conservation through engineering, but that doesn't mean that we should be building our facilities in a nature reserve. We want to still promote con and conserve our nature reserves. We also want to secure ecological sustainable development. So sustainable development, it's that nice keyword that you've probably heard before. So sustainability, we're looking at people, planet, and our profit. So we want to be able to have whatever we have today, we want to be able to have tomorrow. So we want to have the same profit, we want to have the same impact to the people so we don't want to harm the people and we also don't want to harm the planet or the environment so that's what we refer to about sustainable development so secure these and the use of ecological uh, sorry of natural resources but we want to still promote justifiable economic and social development so there's that where i talk about the sustainability being not just environment or ecological but it also means economic and social the people aspect of this so this is all as part of the constitution of south africa and the Constitution of South Africa is the highest level of law in the country. So this is very important as far as the legal framework is concerned. Okay, we also have the next part of the Constitution, which might relate to environmental engineering, is that everyone has access. Section 32 means that we have access to information. So everyone has the right to access any information held by the state and any information that has held by another person that is required for the exercise or protection of any of my rights. So if you feel that your rights have been neglected and that you feel that a company is withholding information from you, you have the constitution behind you to gather that information. It also means any information that is held by the state, so is any government department or similar, if they have any information, they have to share it with you. So the sort of information that we might be interested in here is the level of air pollution, water pollution, natural reserves and things like that. So as a citizen of South Africa or as an engineer on your site one day, you're allowed, you have the right to access this sort of information to improve the well-being of the surroundings for nature or for you. Okay, so please remember that is part of the constitution as well. Other sections in the environment also have, you have the right to administrative justice. So again, that might not seem like an environmental issue. But if we are talking about the environment, that justice, sorry, just, well, it's a bit of a repetition there. If you want justice, that applies to all things, including the environment. 
Section 38, I'm not going to read through this one. You also uh, have the right to enforcement of these rights of yours. So anyone listed in the section has the right to approach a competent court alleging that one of your rights has been infringed and anyone can go to the court to make sure. Yeah, I'll let you read that one because it's a bit long and I'm starting to fall there. Okay. In terms of what we said with the national, also the hierarchy of legislation, we said that there was also something called international law on that. And I said, we're not going to touch on international law in this course. However, I just want to highlight to you that in section 231, so we've jumped quite far down in the constitution. So it's probably, I think it's the second last, what might even be the very, very last section in the constitution, says that as part of the South African law, we abide by international agreements. So any of the negotiating or signing of international agreements will be the responsibility of the national executive. So international law is sitting at the very highest level of government and the national executive of parliament. So we are going to abide by international laws. OK, so again, I'm not going to read through through any of this. It just lays out that even though we are a developing country and the question last week was, should we be worried about environmental issues if it's going to cost us money and we can't actually feed people why would we worry about the environment the government the constitution the legal frameworks takes environmental issues very seriously and international agreements very seriously so as i say this constitution that is the highest level of legislation in the country so that's the constitution at the top are there any questions on any of that legislation or sorry on the constitution as we've been through it so far. I realize some of you have probably missed out some slides. Um, I see I am still connected to both Big Blue Button and, and Teams. So if you have any questions, just quickly let me go. I need a sip of water. OK, so that is the legislation. Oh, sorry, the Constitution. In terms of legislation, the next one up is going to be, as I've already said, is going to be the national Acts of Parliament. So National Acts of Parliament, the big one I've already mentioned, is the National Environmental Management Act, Act 107 of 1998. And in terms of this, it's a long one, but it aims effectively, so it's often called NEMA, it aims to provide the cooperative environmental governance to establish principles for decision making related to the environment. So I've highlighted section two here. Somebody's already asked me, can you find these acts online? You can find these acts online. I've actually given you the link in the touch. So if you go to the touch, there is a link on finding all the environmental acts in South Africa. And the link to the constitution was in the previous slide. Okay, so you can have a look at this one. This is a very long act. So I'm not expecting you to know anything specific about the act beyond what the general understand. Sorry, the general theme of the act is, so to speak. Okay, so the theme of this one is general environmental management and it must put the people and their needs at the forefront of its concern to serve their needs. It must also help with the development of social, environmentally and economically viable options. So you mustn't look at degradation of the environment to the benefit of somebody else and vice versa. Okay. So the main key on this one is coming back to that word we used before, sustainable development. So sustainable development, this act is looking at both the people, the planet and the profit. So it's the economics, the social aspects and the environment. Okay, so this is going to be the big act of parliament. There are lots of other acts. Okay, so there are tons of acts here and for the sake of this course, and you'll see in your tat, I'm just going to give you a list of all these acts and I'm going to ask you to look at, I can't remember if I said two or three. So for your tat this week, I'm going to ask you to look at any two of the act or two or three, just click on the tat of the acts and find a brief description of what exactly that act covers. So a lot of these acts are from the Department of Environmental Affairs and Tourism, or is that their correct? I'm sorry, I've gone blank now. Is that actually their correct name? Some of them are from the Devire Department of Agriculture or, for, or more specifically related to forestry and marine pollution. All of them, however, relate to the environment. And as a future engineer, you might have some of these that are applicable. Okay, so things like the Environmental Conservation Act, that sounds fairly obvious. The merchant shipping laws, so this relates to the oil pollution, so that's not necessarily specific to any of us 
or many of us in the future, but if you obviously pollute the ocean, you can't throw oil into pollution. There is an act that stops you from doing that. There are various other ones on the marine, so marine living resources, marine pollution. There's two of those, in fact. And then there are a whole bunch of national environmental management acts. Okay, so the first one we've already dealt with, or we've dealt with one, if I just skip back a slide, there's the National Environmental Management Act, which is what we had on the previous page. If we go back to the list here now, so I'm just keeping an eye on the lag that I see we're getting on online here. We again have the National Environmental Management Act. There's an integrated coastal management act. There's one for air quality, biodiversity, protected areas, as well as waste. So each of these acts are related to a specific area of the environment, and you can read up about all of these as you need to for the TUT. One thing to note on some of these acts, so these ones that I've got here, I can see a 19, I'm just having a quick look. So there's a 1986 act here. So some of these acts are fairly old. There are some acts, I think on the next slide, there's some older ones. There are some acts that I've seen when I was looking up and just checking on some of these acts that goes far back as the 1940s. So even though they are very old, they are still seen in legal terms as valid and you can still get prosecuted in the law. It doesn't matter how old these acts are. Okay, there's the 1981, sorry. Okay, so these are all acts relative, related to the environment. There are several other acts that we also have in South Africa that might be of relevance. There's the National Heritage Resources Act. So that is what is a national heritage. So it will define it in that act. The Felt and Forest Fire Act, obviously that's relating to forests. So that's very clearly environmental issue. The SBCA, the Societies for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, they also have an act. So the environment, as we said before, it is not just you and me, but it's everything around us. So the animals, we can't be cruel to animals. So that's obviously an environmental act as well. So if you're running a site, we can't have cruelty to animals happening on it as well. Okay. Some other acts, the South African Maritime Aeronautical, South African Weather and Services Act. I'm not sure any of us will ever have to deal with those ones. The one at the bottom though, the Water Services Act, and there was a National Water Act somewhere as well. I think I skipped over. And there's the water, yeah. So the Water Services Act is going to be important for a lot of people, South Africa being a very, or being a water scarce country. Water is important, so there's an act relating to water. Okay, so I'm sure most of us will see that one in our careers at some point. We are going to be dealing more specifically with water and water related issues in the coming weeks. So that Water Act will come back to us again as well. I also mentioned last week, I'm just waiting for it to flip over. I mentioned last week that this course is going to be looking at environmental engineering as well as process safety, loss prevention and risk management and risk risk issues. So you, you're tight again, you were looking at explosions and oil spills and things like that from natural disasters. There are acts as well that are going to look at how we can protect the health and safety of individuals both on the site as well as off the site. So in South Africa, we have the Explosives Act, particularly relating obviously to explosives. We have a Hazardous Substances Act. So what and what, where, why are hazardous substances and how do you need to deal with mine health and safety act? So some of you are, a lot of us actually have worked on a mine before. So, and you will again, so what do you need to know about mine health and safety? as well as National Radioactive Disposal Act, which is there. Okay, there's an Occupational Health and Safety Act as well, which I seem to have dropped off this one. So what exactly do you need to do to protect your workers as they are on site? Okay, so again, you are going to be, um, you are going to have roles of seniority in your company one day, and you need to make sure that not only is the environment protected, but the occupational health of your workers needs to be taken into account as well. So I'll update these slides to include the one or two that I see I've actually left off here, or that have been left off here. So the Occupational Health and Safety Act, we will get to that one later on in the course as well. So you don't need to worry about that one now too much. Okay. Are there any questions so far? I see I'm getting private messages here. I just want to read through quickly. So if you have any queries, please just let me know.
because we are we're having a short lecture today. We've only got one slide left. Okay, so I've had one a question that's come through on the chat on the private chat is asking why doesn't the government make make people more aware of all of these acts that are around. So in particular, if we think of the environmental aspects for this course, people in Pumalanga, Limpopo, many of the rural areas are often getting their rights infringed upon, possibly because they don't know their rights. Um, why, what can we do to, to alleviate that? So I think one of the problems with law in particular, any of you that have ever seen any legal TV show or you have friends that are lawyers. My friends that are lawyers drive the fancy BMWs and the Mercedes Benz and it's very expensive to their services are very expensive. So people in the rural areas are having their rights, may, may be having their rights infringed upon. If you can find some, some nice lawyers that are willing to give of their free time, that would certainly help. Um, but the legal game is a very expensive one, unfortunately. So it possibly isn't government make people aware of laws being infringed upon, but it's government themselves that probably also need to ensure that people's rights are not being infringed upon or groups getting together to make sure that they're not getting infringed. certain um, groups of people that do look at that. So WWF working oh, World Wildlife Fund and others. SVCA obviously looks at the cruelty for animals. So there are groups that look um, it's just a matter of who and how. Okay. So the other question is I mean, what is go into these laws for the tests and the exams? I need you to know let me just go back. Sorry, I'm on the wrong screen. I don't know if I've answered the question that was posed in private just to let you know. I need you to know there is legislation in South Africa, the constitution, national legislation, provincial legislation, and local bylaws. Know that. And I need you to know that there is something called the constitution. And I need you to know that there are national acts of parliament. I am never going to ask, or I am not going to ask you to please recite section two of the National Managed Environmental Management Act or to ask you which of the acts covers this or covers that. So I will, yeah, the only thing I'm ever going to ask you is basic understanding of why, why do we need law? What exactly does it do? What are the consequences of this? So the introductory stuff, I'm not going to ask you specifics of, any, of the constitution or any of the national acts of parliament or bylaws or items like that. Okay. I hope that answered the question there on what do you need to know? Okay. okay. So into the textbook. So I'm also getting questions on where exactly is this stuff in the textbook, this stuff. So I think for the first three weeks of the course, we're not really following the textbook, to be honest. Okay. So the first three weeks, we're not following the textbook. As of week four, we are going to be following the textbook more closely. So as you're all aware, there is this is the start of the term. There have been issues with registration for certain students and all of that. So we are taking it a little bit slowly to start with, to be honest. So this is not in the textbook. This is a real easy week. There's nothing that's going to be examined except your understanding of the law. Why do we need law? What are the hierarchy of the law? That's it. OK, so in terms of the textbook this week, there is nothing in the textbook because the textbook is not a South African law law section. Once we get to the end of the month and once all registrations have been sorted out and we can, we hope that everything is now back to normal with progress um, or everything sorted out at the university, we are then going to ramp the course up a little bit. Okay, so I don't want to, to go too fast and too, too quickly into the textbook items. It also allows you to get to give you time to go and find the textbook as well. Okay, so this week there is no, no textbook material. Okay, so I've been asked to re-explain what the textbook, what I mean by what I'm going to ask you in an exam. So let me just go through. I'm going to start from the beginning. I'm going to go very quickly through this presentation again. Okay, so in terms of the exam, I need you to understand why do we have environmental law? 
I need you to understand why there is a need and that we have this thing called the National Environmental Management Act and that governs a lot of things. I don't need you to know the exact clauses, the exact things, but I need you to know that, that the NEMA exists. I need you to know that ISO exists and that it's environmental compliance issue. I'm never going to ask you more than that. I need you to know what happens if you don't abide by the law. Uh, that one we can skip. I need you to know that there are different levels of the law. And in particular, I need you to know that there is constitution, legislation, national legislation, provincial legislation, and local bylaws. So that's what I need you to know. I then also need you to know that there is something called the constitution and it covers various basic rights. I do not need you to be able to recite section seven, section nine, section 31, 34, 24. Okay. So I'm never going to ask you to open up the constitution and tell me about a different section. Okay. This exam is, pro is going to be open book. So it's wasting both your time and my time to ask you to go onto a website just to download section 24 of the constitution. Okay. One day when you're working, you need to know that there are these different things and this is in your best interest to know your rights as a South African citizen, what is in the constitution of South Africa, not just on the environmental side, but on everything. For the exam, as I've already said, and the tests, you need to know that the National Environmental Management Act exists and this is the general everything that it covers. I do not need you to know anything about any of these acts. Okay. I need you again as a personal, as a good citizen to know that all of these acts exist, both for the environment and big blue buttons being a bit slow to change here now. So I need you to know in terms of a good citizen that all of these acts and one day, depending on where you are working, you are going to have to abide by the relative relevant acts in your interest or your or whatever that may be in the environment and in terms of health and safety. Okay, I hope I've answered that question in terms of how we are going to do this for the exam. The last thing in terms of South African law that I'm going to worry about for today is that please don't forget there's also provincial legislation and local bylaws. So in the tut, I've sent you to a website for government and I think it's on that same page. So in the on that page, there's a link that sends you to a government website. On the left hand side of the menu, you can change it to the national acts, you can change it to provincial legislation, their notices, various other things that the government, um, various documents that they've got. One of them is provincial legislation, so you can change it to provincial legislation and play around there and see what's relevant. So each of the province or most of the provinces have laws that state that you are not allowed for, I'm not sure if you're aware, you are not allowed to pick a flower on the side of the road. So I'm not sure how many of you knew that. So there are leg the provincial bylaws that say that within 100 meters from the road, you're not allowed to pick a flower. So there are various different things like that. As I've already said, there are also local bylaws. Typically, local bylaws are rules around closing times for pubs and clubs and things in residential areas, noise and things like that. Often those local bylaws are things that you would get irritated with and you'd phone the police to come and sort out your neighbor. Okay. Are there any other questions on this? I see we're getting people dropping off and coming by. See, everyone's also having problems like me. The number of students is jumping up and down all over the place. Are there any other questions? Because I'm going to leave the lecture for there. I would like you to please look at the TUT. It's in your best interest to load the discussions as we've got online. You've seen how I've battled with my internet today. Um, so if you've missed anything, please can you highlight it in the discussion? There's a discussion page for this week's notes, either the TUT or the, the lecture. You can ask queries there. I'd prefer you to ask me there as a first option, please, because the chance are the rest of your classmates have the same question. If it's a little bit more private and you want to email me, please feel free to email me. The TUT tomorrow, you've already got the TUT. Please can you make sure that you have that done again by this time next week effectively so that you can your Friday session starts on a fresh tut. I will not be needing to see you tomorrow so please do that tut in your own time and as I say can you upload it through to the canvas page. 
A change that I've made on the Candice page, apologies for those of you that were battling with this or you've already done it. In order for me to see who's actually registered and be and able to access things properly, I've set prerequisites for week to week. So you can't access next week's material until you've finished certain aspects of this week. So likewise, you can't get this week's material unless you've finished last week's material. So please just make sure that you click through that. I think it's hiding everything for you until you've clicked through on everything. So finish this week's material and then next week's material will pop up. Okay, when it obviously if you if you click it too fast, it's not up yet. It'll only come up on Monday probably. Okay. Have I still got all of you online? Am I talking to myself? Is there any last comments before I end the session? So sorry, big blue button, your recording. I don't know what happened with your recording. So Teams meeting has been recorded. Once it's recorded, I will download it and put a link onto the Uwazi site so that you can find it. Um, if there are no questions, I'm happy for you to go. I think next week, we might try and only use one of the, the platforms, the teams of the big blue button. But now that I've figured it out, maybe we can run both. I'll just have to see. Class rep can maybe let me know whether teams or big blue button or trying to run them simultaneously, which one works better.